Marsh Kearns Goodwin is a presidential historian. And she wrote a recent book, among many that she's written, called Leadership in Turbulent Times. And in an interview recently, uh, as she was interviewed about that book, uh, she's referring to it, when this is a quote from her, they kept growing, talking about leaders in turbulent times. They kept growing through loss and adversity. They had resilience. They eventually developed humility even if they started without it. They knew how to talk to people with stories. They built teams of more strong-minded people who could disagree with them. They had the emotional intelligence to deal with those teams. Those words might not have been known then, but we know now. They somehow were able to connect to the people directly and control negative emotions. All things shine a light on today, she says. And they all had an ambition that was larger than themselves, eventually. And that's the key thing. She mentions humility, empathy, understanding both sides of the struggle, integrity, willing to consult others, caring more about the cause than self. Paul, who is my New Testament hero, like David is my Old Testament hero, Paul, more than any other, did more to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus than anyone else. I think that's indisputable. He's the great leader in the early church. Uh, he considered himself and felt called as an apostle. In fact, there are books written that say the apostle. He was the leader. How does he stack up as a leader? This is his evaluation of himself. Early on, he says that he is unfit. A little later on, he says, I'm the least. And finally, he says, I'm the worst. Uh, hardly a, a glowing conviction about himself. First of all, in one of his earliest letters, written probably in 57 A.D. to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 15 is going to sound familiar to you because it's, it's where he proves for himself and others the fact of the resurrection of Jesus. He says, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn have received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom were still alive at this writing, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is of me least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle. That's his first evaluation of himself that we have. He says, for one thing, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. And of course, you may remember when Paul first met Jesus, he was on the road to Damascus. He was going there to destroy the Lord's followers, he says. Brilliant light from heaven <coughs> suddenly beamed down upon him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, sir? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Paul never forgot that, of course, that he was the one who persecuted the church. 
He was not one of the original 12, of course you know that. He needed to see the resurrection Jesus. And he did. And so he was called later to be an apostle. He had to prove himself. He had to prove his credentials to be included among the apostles, to be a leader. And of course, his conversion turned his life upside down. It turned the developing church inside out. And it remains to this day for many people, particularly Jewish folks, uh, kind of an obstruction to them. How could this Pharisee, who was so opposed to the church, suddenly be the apostle? Paul himself never forgot where he came from. With Paul and for all of us, I think we dare not forget where we came from. I'm not responsible for my birth. I'm not responsible for my heart, my heart and my mind preparation when I first heard the gospel. I am what I am as a professional through forces and decisions and abilities, none of which were made by me alone. By the grace of God, Paul says, and I agree, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, Paul says, I worked harder than any of them. No, it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. God in his grace has been at work in Paul's life and continue to be at work in Paul's life and in mine and in yours, even before we had any knowledge of God himself. By the grace of God, I am what I am. All that I am, my heritage, my strengths, my relationships, I am by the grace of God. What's Paul's response to this? His grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them. My uniqueness, my unique place, my calling is my responsibility now requiring my effort, and so Paul says, I work harder. A little bragging here, maybe? Not really. Paul adds, so it was not I working harder, but the grace of God that is <coughs> even my motivations, my hard work, my integrity, I work harder than any of them. No, it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. We recognize or we need to with Paul that it is by God's grace that we are what we are. It is by God's grace that we do what we do, our motivation, our ability to use the opportunities God has given us. It's all by God's grace. Grace, grace, grace. Well, that's the first thing that Paul says back to the Corinthian church, maybe 57 AD. I'm the least of the apostles, unfit to be an apostle. And then he writes a letter to the Ephesian church, probably five or six years later. This is in chapter 3, verse 7. Now this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power, although I'm the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ. From the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, that's a high office, the highest, to I'm the very least of all the saints. Now Paul doesn't just compare himself with the other apostles, he compares himself with all of God's people, because Paul doesn't have in his mind St. Peter or St. John or in our day St. Francis or somebody other who is a canonized saint. No, no, when he writes every one of his letters, including this one, to the Ephesians, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. The saints are God's people, those who are in Christ. And now he says, I'm the least of all the saints. I'm the least of all God's people. Every year, for a lot of years now, I've gone to the pastor's conference at America's Keswick. And 
one of the things the director always says to all the pastors that are sitting there, you are my heroes. And I always feel like I end up and say, you're wrong. Our job is to minister to people who are the heroes. They're the folks, you're the folks who are out there in the world, in your jobs, next door to your neighbors, who have to live out the Christian faith. That's my heroes, not the pastors. We got it easy. Of course, we have to do the same thing you do when we're with our neighbors, but you get my point. Paul says, I'm the least of all the saints. C.S. Lewis, I don't know whether you've read The Great Divorce, but it's a, it's a fictional account of a man who goes from the outskirts of hell to the outskirts of heaven. They do it on a bus and all that. You know, C.S. Lewis has a wonderful imagination. And the narrator, who is telling the story, sees a beautiful lady in heaven, coming out from heaven, as it were, bathed in an almost unbearable light, Lewis writes, with a great entourage of beings honoring her. He wonders if this is some really famous person. And his guide says, not at all. It's someone you'll never heard of. Her name on earth was Sarah Smith, and she lived at Golders Green. Well, the man says, she seems to be well person of particular importance. Yes, she's one of the great ones. You need to understand that fame in this country and on earth are two quite different things. Although I'm the very least, Paul says, of all the saints, I become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. I become a servant According to the gift of God's grace. God has given me the grace to become a servant. I have the honor of being a servant. Servant? Not a boss. Not the chief. Not the guy with the corner office. A unique dispute, Luke tells us, rose among Jesus' disciples as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greatest? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? No, but I'm among you, and one who serves. The standard of greatness, the standard of leadership, is serving, serving others. Again, remember Gar's Terence Goodman's analysis of real leadership, humility, empathy, integrity, caring more about the cause than the self. This grace was given to me, Paul says, to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ. That's his purpose. That's what matters in living out his days that I've maintained for you and I as well. To bring to others the news of the boundless riches of Christ. The boundless riches. The privilege of knowing him. The privilege of knowing his love, his peace, purpose that comes through knowing him. Most of all, knowing him. Well, from the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, but the least of all the saints, Paul writes this near the end of his life, maybe in 65 AD, one of his last letters in any case, to his son of the faith, Timothy, in the first chapter at verse 12, he says, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly and unbelief. And the 
grace of our Lord overflow through me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy. So that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, to honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So from unfit to be an apostle, to the very least of all the saints, now of sinners I am the foremost. Seems strange, doesn't it? The climax of lifelong witness as an apostle to the grace of God in this way. We, we would think that he might have started with, I'm the worst of sinners, and I'm the least of the saints, and, and, and I'm the, the least of the apostles. You know, kind of going from sinner to saint to apostle. No, he goes the other way. Early on, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the least of all the saints. Not the worst of sinners. Paul stood in all, right to the end of his life, that God and Christ would forgive him. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, he says, the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. If God could save me, Paul says, nobody's lost. Paul, the great apostle, said, I'm the foremost of sinners. I require God's utmost patience. I may have said this to you before, but I'm the worst sinner I know. I don't know your hearts. I don't know what you do every day. I don't know your thinking. I just know me. So I'm the worst sinner I know. And how thankful I am. And I trust you are too, that you can say, this saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, even me. He didn't come to condemn me. Loved me and came to save me. So with Paul, I can say the grace of our Lord overflowed to me in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And I'm with David. I can say, Do you deal with everyone this way, O sovereign Lord? What more can I say? You know what I'm really like, sovereign Lord. For the sake of your promise and according to your will, you've done great things for me. How great you are. Grace. We talk about grace in every one of these passages. Did you notice it? It's the one word that appears every time. By the grace of God, I am what I am, Paul said. This grace was given to me, he says. And the grace of our Lord overflowed third time. Grace, grace, grace. As a leader, Paul recognized that his gifts, his position, were gifts of God. Grace of God. He sees his relationship to the people he serves as a servant. The people he leads. Just like his Lord. He sees his relationship to his Lord as one of grace. The grace of God's love and forgiveness. So as Paul ends the passage in Timothy, I, I want to proclaim with you that the king of the ages, 